Uh, but as you can tell, we're a little low this morning. We've got several that are on, uh, with, with fall break. A lot of people are on the road, so we want to keep them in your prayers. Uh, any announcements we have coming up? The youth are going to hang out this evening. We hadn't figured out where we were. we got a, a, a smaller crew, and they, they want, I don't know why they like hanging out, uh, but we're going to hang out this evening. Uh, and we have the Fall Fest coming up. Be excited about that. You'll see and hear more about that soon. But that's one of our largest outreaches uh, is uh, Fall Festival uh, that we uh, reach out to the community. And it'll be the Wednesday before Halloween. So that's the 26th. If you can put that on your calendar. That is on its way. Uh, and a lot of, lot of, lot of things are on the, on the move. But um, we want to just welcome you here this morning. We are so glad you're here. We have several new faces in the crowd, or maybe first time in a while. We want to welcome you here. We're glad you're here. Uh, if you came prepared today to, to give, we do have the opportunity you can give online. There are boxes in the back. But if this is first time, or you're a visitor with us, we don't want anything from you. We want everything for you. We want to encourage you and say we're glad you're here. Thank you all for being here this morning. We're going to go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house, to, to lean into your word, to hear your word clearly. Father, I thank you for, for Sunday school teachers that have poured into their, their classes, who have studied their lesson and just poured into their, their students and into their, uh, their other um, class members. And I just thank you for the chance to, to come today and sing praises to you. Father, I pray that as we, as we come together, that we would lean into you, that we would hear your heart, uh, and that we would sing praises to you. I thank you for the chance to worship you today. We love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Glad you're here this morning. Stand with me uh, before we get started singing here. Um, just want to remind everybody on next Saturday, October 8th, uh, we are going to be going to Disaster Relief Training in London. So if you or somebody you know uh, that you think might be interested, have them text me or just come talk to me and we can get you on the list. Uh, but we're going to worship this morning, and, and our, it's a prayer, this first song is a prayer that God would open our eyes to his word and to his way this morning. So let's sing together. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Sing that again. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see you, holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the Great I Am. Lord 
Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the Great I Am. Amen. You can be seated as Melissa comes and sings for us this morning. You know, in our lives, we um, sometimes often forget to thank God for just the little things in life, and that's a little bit about what this song is. Sometimes it's just a gentle breeze Or the way the sun shines through the trees Makes me stop and think of all your blessings A moonlit night, a gentle rain Sometimes it's in the little things I feel the peace that only you can give It's the little things to remind me that you love me And the little things to let me know Are the little things to show how much you care Sometimes it's in the birth of spring When the flowers bloom and the robins sing Makes me stop and think of all Given. Autumn leaves and pretty butterflies The years for snow a starlit night The greatest artist canvas is your sky It's the little things to remind me that you love Aren't we? I 
just seems like every time somebody different sings, and I'm reminded of how uh, gifted we are, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, one thing I want to point out in the bulletin, it's two weeks away, October the 16th. We're having a church-wide photo. How about that? Now, let me explain what that means. I believe this came from our um, uh, decorating team, the fine ladies that make our church look beautiful. They had come up with that. Um, we have some older pictures of our church, and I mean like really old pictures of our church uh, that were taken many years ago, like decades ago, and we haven't done one in a very long time. So two weeks from today, at the conclusion of the morning service, as orderly as we can, right? Got to make it sound official, right, Brother Don? As orderly as we can, we're all going to go out the back uh, of the sanctuary on the opposite side of that wall there in the front of the church and take one big group photo, okay? And that'll be two weeks from now. If the weather isn't cooperative, we'll put it off to the next Sunday. So just wanted to give you a heads up, uh, mark that down so you can anticipate it and put your smile on, all right? Well, let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this time that we can gather together as your people and worship you. Father, it is the little things, and Father, we thank you for every single thing you do in our lives. Thank you for life. Thank you for breath. Thank you for salvation. Lord, thank you that we can come today and worship you. Lord, we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we continue through 1 Peter, it's a book of, of being persistent despite struggle, despite hardship. Um, and the first verse of this song says, A thousand times I've failed, still your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, still I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting your light shines when all else fades, never ending your glory goes beyond all fame. And this song came from a, a guy who was writing uh, who, was, who would perform on stage at all these big concerts and stuff. He said, when the lights fade, when, it, when everything that I put out front in public goes away and I'm just with me and my failures and alone with God, he said, your glory and your grace remains. And it goes beyond all the fame, all the recognition, all of everything. And so as we continue in First Peter, uh, let's keep that thought at the front of our minds that no matter what hardships or trials we might go through, we might not always pass the test, but his grace and his mercy still remain. So stand with me this morning. A thousand times I've failed, still your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, Still I'm caught in your grace Everlasting Your light will shine when all else fades Never ending Your glory goes beyond all fame Will above my purpose remains the art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all things my heart and my soul I give you control Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace. To love you from the inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all things. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out, Lord, my soul cries out. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise 
from the end Sighed out, Lord, my soul Cries out from the end Sighed out, Lord, my soul Cries out Come now, fountain Every blessing To my heart to sing my praise Streams of mercy Never cease Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming love Here I raise my heaven by thy help I come, and I hope thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger. Interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a day. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave. God I love Here's my heart Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above Amen, you can be seated Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Good morning. I'm so glad y'all came. I was thinking about this week. I don't know if they do this in cartoons still. You can tell me if they do or not. When I was a kid, I loved, I watched some, this week I, I saw some classic cartoons with Bugs Bunny and, and some, I just, it was on. I thought, wow, I hadn't seen this forever. Um, and I, I love the, the point. Many times what they'll do is there'll be a part in one of their little things to where... <clears throat> They'll try to be making a decision, and a little angel will pop up on their shoulder and say, you know what's right to do. You should do the right thing. And then what happens? Right? This guy over here. No, you do it for yourself. No one's looking. Nobody will care. And, and there's this like back and forth arguing between the, between the devil and the little angel. And, and we, we kind of laugh at that. I'm not sure they still do that, but we kind of laugh at that. Um, but really and truly, that happens. Now, it's not like in the Bible. We, we read in the Bible in, in Genesis where, where Adam and Eve are, you know, they're in the garden. It says, now the serpent was the most cunning of the wild animals that the Lord had made. Uh, he said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said, we may eat from any fruit of the tree of the garden, but the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God says, you must not eat it. All right? So at the, even in that little story, we have a, did God really say? Well, God did say. And we have this back and forth. And sometimes we don't realize that we go through that quite often. I was thinking about it the other day. I can say this. Miss Stephanie's having a nursery, so I can say what I want. <laughs> we were in the car. And Miss Stephanie just nicely said, wasn't that your turn? And I was talking to her. Well, you distracted me. I didn't say that, but I was thinking it. 
And I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll turn up here. And, and, and all of a sudden, I hear this voice in my head saying, she doesn't think you can drive. <laughs> and this woman said, you know she I said, shut up. I'm talking to him. And I, I said, yeah, she doesn't think I can, talk, I can drive. And then all of a sudden, he said, she doesn't trust you to get where you need to be. She doesn't trust me. She said, you drive every day by yourself just fine. Doesn't she know that? She doesn't know that. And before long, I'm going to go, get out of the car. <laughs> but some, you know, I heard a preacher one time say, he said, I got two dogs on one, well, he's a one on each shoulder. And he said, one's barking at me, telling me the wrong thing, and one's trying to tell me the right thing. And the guy says, who wins the fight? He said, the one I feed, mm. the one I listen to. Because see, I, in that moment, I said, hey, I'm listening to him. I could have easily said, you know what? I'm not listening to you. See, if, if Eve had walked away and said, uh, uh, no, this isn't what God said, she could have shut that down and fed the right voice in her head, the Holy Spirit. She could have listened to that one. And I could have said, you know what? No. She was just, I, I did miss my, my, my turn, and, and she does trust me, and she loves me, I've got a good wife. and I could have fed this one, but in that moment, I fed this one. And even the Apostle Paul says, the things I want to do, I don't do. And There's always a war, but we've got we've to note that, that sometimes when that voice pops in your head, call him out. Because you know what? The darkness hates the light. And as soon as you say, uh-uh, Satan, that's not my God. That's not the way I'm going to think. I know what you're doing, and I'm not doing it. If she had done that, if Eve had said, mm-mm, Satan, no, no, that's a lie. I'm, I'm going to walk over here. You can do what you want, but I'm going to walk over here. She could have said no to, the, to that wrong voice. So this week, I want us to pay attention because maybe it says, you know what? Mom won't notice if I grab an extra cookie. You know what? Mom won't notice if I just push my toys under my bed instead of cleaning up my room. Know where that comes from. It's from Dad. No, it's from Satan. <laughs> but let's make some wise choices this week and pay attention to the voices that we hear and feed the good voices. Let's pray. Dear Father, there is a war inside our mind. It's a war for our heart. Father, help us walk with you. Help us follow your example and lean into your truth. And as soon as we hear darkness creeping in, as soon as we hear a lie in our mind, help us shut that down. I thank you for helping us, Father. You said we, we won't have to go through those decisions alone. That in those situations, you will give us a way out. It's like you're pointing at the door. Say, so shut that one and open this one right here. This is a good door. Father, I thank you for walking with us through those tough times. We love you, Jesus, in your name. Everybody said, amen. I'm hoping Danny loses those stickers before lunchtime. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We will finish the chapter today. I'm talking about the battle of the soul. And there is a battle that goes on in every soul. And we're going to look at that. You know, history tells us in many wars, there is always a decisive battle. And it changes the course of history. And the war for America's independence, General George Washington trapped the British at Yorktown, which led to the British surrender. And had he not won that battle, we might be part of the UK. And I'm not talking about North and I were either. Uh, then you've got in Europe, uh, Napoleon's army was sweeping the continent. But in 1815, at the Battle of Waterloo, Lord Wellington was successful in defeating him. And had that battle not been successful, we might all be uh, speaking a different language today. And then who can forget D-Day, World War II, June 6, 1944, when thousands of Allied troops invaded Europe and began the march toward Berlin. Had that invasion failed, who knows, we might all be speaking German. 
But in every war, there is decisive battle. And today we're going to talk about the turning point that changes history. In the battle for our souls, we need to go back and look at what Jesus did for you and I. He won the battle and won the war. You know, when you look at 1 Peter, as we've been going through it verse by verse for a few weeks now, uh, a pattern emerges as you read 1 Peter, and that is imperatives follow realities. In other words, he, he mentions a reality, and then based on that reality, he tells us what to do. Um, Peter says what's happened to us as Christians or who we are as Christians, and he follows it with a command or an encouragement. For example, in chapter 1, the first few verses, Peter talks about how believers have been born again. And because of this, they are to set their hope fully on the grace of God that is to be revealed when he returns. And then last week, some of the passages we looked at, uh, Peter talks about living a holy life. And uh, it's because we've been born again. And so each thing kind of builds on the other. Well, go back and look at chapter 2, verse 10. That's where we ended last week. And notice what he calls us. This is the reality. Uh, Peter calls us, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so now the reality is we are God's people. We're children of God. We have been born again, saved by His grace, and we are God's people, and therefore we need to do what He says next. And so there, and um, in the verse 11 and following, we'll look. But before we do, I want to put this in uh, context for a moment. I want to go back to the night that Jesus was arrested, and uh, ultimately it led to his death on the cross. It's in Mark 14, and I want to kind of capture the scene before we move forward. In Mark 14, verse 27, Jesus said to them all, uh, he said to his disciples, all of you will fall away because it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now he's quoting Zechariah the prophet there, but Jesus is saying that they're going to strike me and all of you are going to leave. But after I have risen, he said, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. And then Peter says, even if everyone falls away, I will not. Okay? I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to him, today, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter kept insisting, if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And then it says, and they all said the same thing. So this is crunch time. This is the moment where they come after Jesus and everybody scatters. Jesus knows it's going to happen. It fulfills scripture. He says it straight up. And then Peter's like, oh, no, 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 no. You got it all wrong, Lord. We've heard that before, right? And he says, Lord, I will never, I will never do that. And then Peter uh, is called out by Jesus when he says, you know, before the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. I don't know about you, Brother Don. That's what I always heard. Why preachers like fried chicken? Been a war between them ever since. I don't know. But anyway, so here's what happens here. So he says here that they came to a place there in Mark 14, verse 32. They came to a place named Gethsemane. And he told his disciples, sit here. While I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him. Notice he didn't take all 12. He took his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. And he said to them, I'm deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake. And he went a little farther. He fell to the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, All things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And then he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, did you catch that? Remember Peter's old name is Simon. And because of his faith in Christ, he's like a rock. And so Jesus changed his name from Simon to Peter. But he says to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not stay awake one hour? Stay awake. And pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now already, already while Jesus brings his inner circle aside and he begins to pray because he knows what's coming, already Peter's getting weak. 
Already, he can't keep his eyes open to pray. And when Jesus comes to check on him, he says, not Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Like, it's slipping. And then when we go to John 18, we learn from John's gospel that when the mob shows up to take Jesus, it says, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, he drew it, he struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear, and the servant's name was Malchus. And at that, Jesus said to Peter, put your sword away. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? Now connect the dots there for a minute. Peter says, Lord, I'll never let you down. I'll die for you. And Jesus says, no, you won't. Before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. And then they retreat to pray. And he brings three of the twelve with him, one of them including Peter. Stay here while I go pray. And what's he praying about? Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He's praying about the cup that he knows he's about to drink. And then here comes the mob. But when he goes back to check on them, uh, he says, Simon, not Peter, but Simon, are you sleeping? Don't you know the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak? And then here comes the mob. And Peter, you know, he's fixing to take charge. He takes his sword out, cuts the guy's ear off. Jesus says, put that away. Don't you know I'm supposed to drink the cup? Already Peter's missed it. He's completely missed what God is doing in that moment. He's not aware of God's activity. He's not on the same page as God's agenda. And he's completely missed the boat. Luke, not Luke, yeah, Dr. Luke tells us in his gospel something that I've always found fascinating. We know what happens next. We know that they take Jesus into custody, and we know that ultimately John and Peter follow along. John knew somebody. He gets in. Uh, he goes back and tells them, let this guy in. And so Peter gets into the courtyard, and Peter is around a bonfire, and he's kind of hanging out because it's cold, and they're around the fire, and Peter's kind of hanging out to see what's going to happen to Jesus. And we know that Ultimately, people look at Peter and go, hey, aren't you the one? Weren't you with him? Hey, you're a Galilean. I can tell by your accent. Do you know this man? Were you one of his disciples? And one, two, three times, Peter denies him. No, I don't even know the man. But Luke gives us one little detail that nobody else does. And I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but it's in Luke 22, verse 60. On the third of the three denials, Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. And then, in verse 61, then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Wow. A different gospel account says that he remembered what Jesus said. But Luke says the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now, I don't know how far away they were. It doesn't matter. But when you make eye contact, poof, he felt it. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times. And Peter went outside and wept bitterly. Wow. Now, today we're going to talk about the battle of the soul. And I wanted to take you down that trail first to help you understand that Peter understands the battle of the soul. And he understands what it's like to completely fail. And I want you to look at the difference between Peter's failure and Jesus' success. Peter failed. He thought, I can do this. Lord, I'm not going to let you down. I'll be with you now. I'll be with you to the end. And then when the mob shows up, I'm, I have a sword. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I can do this. And yet none of it was what the Lord wanted. The Lord he could have called down a legion of angels if he wanted, but he was seeking the will of the Father. And he knew what God had sent him here to do. He knew that the cross was in front of him. And he asked, Lord, if it's possible, if it's possible, if there's any other way, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And he submitted to the Father, and he was willing to drink the cup. And we can learn from Jesus' willingness to submit well, look, if you will, in 1 Peter 2, 
starting in verse 11, we're going to look at this battle of the soul. And you're going to see there's three different things that come up in the battle of the soul. The first one is sinful desires. There in 1 Peter 2.11, he says, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Now, we just said in verse 10 that we are now God's people. Once we weren't, now we are. Before we hadn't received mercy, now we have. And because we've received God's mercy, because we are His people, we're citizens of heaven, one of these days we're going to be with Him forever. And while we're on this earth, when it comes to the rest of the world, we're strangers and exiles. We, we, we don't fit in. And we are to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against our soul. This morning in Sunday school, we were looking in James, and it says, what causes wars and fights among you? Isn't it your, your passions? You, you have and you, you, you don't have, but you want. And you, you covet and you kill to get what you want, and you don't get it. And then you ask, but you don't get it uh, because you ask what? With wrong motives, you ask amiss. And so we have these battles inside of us. We have this, uh, these evil desires within us because we live in a fallen world, because we still deal with the flesh and the world and the devil, and we deal with these desires. And we need to be reminded, uh, even in Simon Peter's case, look at him. There is Simon and there is Peter. Simon is the old man. Peter is the new man. And you and I have those moments when we have to ask ourselves when we're struggling, as Danny depicted a while ago, when we're struggling with that tug of war and that battle inside of us, are we going to be Simon, the old man, or are we going to be Peter, the new man that knows Christ and depends on the power of the Holy Spirit? When it comes to the battle of the soul, we have those sinful desires. And um, even Jesus tried to warn Peter. He, he came to him after praying and he said, Peter... He said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Couldn't you stay awake one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you don't enter into temptation for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. There's a second battle of the soul, and that is slander. Boy, that one hurts, don't it? In verse 12, Peter says, conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, They will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits us. That should resonate with us today. Why? Because we're God's people and we're called to walk in his truth. And his truth doesn't always sit well with people in the world. They will look at you and say, you mean you believe this? You mean you're a narrow-minded bigot? You're a this, that, and the other? And all the other labels they use? Uh, They will use all those things to what? To slander you. They will turn the tables and say, you're an evildoer. I'm reminded of Isaiah the prophet who said, what are those who call evil good and good evil? And you know what? We live in a day where people have swapped values and they call good things evil and evil things good. And here we are, and he says, look, the Gentiles, those that are outside the faith, those that don't know Christ, conduct yourselves honorably among them, Because when they slander you, did you see that? So that when they slander you as evildoers, don't be shocked when it happens. Jesus said, the world hated me first, so don't be surprised if the world hates you. That's why James says, you can either be an enemy of the world or a friend of God, but you or you a friend of the world or a friend of God, but you can't be both. You're going to be a friend of one and you're going to be an enemy of the other. And he says, What do you do there? Do you tell them what you really think? Do you fight back? He says, conduct yourselves honorably so that when this happens, when the slander happens, they will observe your good works and you'll be immediately, uh, um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Affirmed and all will go well. Is that what it says? No. It says they will observe your good works and they will glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, that's taking the long perspective. That's Peter saying there will be, there there might be experiences that you have in life that people accuse you of things, and you might not see that rectified until the day of judgment when Christ comes back. But you live your lives in such a way that you 
honor uh, people around you, you honor God, and when they observe your good works, they won't be able to say anything against you. They'll only be able to glorify God when he comes. I love that saying. Different people have been credited with it, but the saying is, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. That is so true. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's how he wants us to handle slander and how he wants us to conduct ourselves in this world. But then there's the third battle of the soul. Some of us deal with sinful desires. Some of us deal with slander. But the third one is submission to authority. This is a biggie. We'll talk more about this as we go through the letter. But submission to authority. Look, if you will, in verse 13. He says, submit to every human authority. Why? Because of the Lord. Whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. Now we've got to be honest with this text here. When we see it, he's talking about how God is, the, God is the one that has all authority. Remember Jesus at the Great Commission? All, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And so Jesus has all authority, but God's word is telling us to submit to every human authority. Why? Because of God, whether it's to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors that are sent by him. Now, here's the implication we just read in verse 12, we, we are to conduct ourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, if you are a child of God, if you're a believer of Jesus Christ, if you're obeying his word, walking in his ways and doing his will, you're not an evildoer. Even though the world might disagree with your testimony and your values and slander you as such. And so what do you do when the authority, the powers of be, say you must submit and they are evil. Think about that. Verse 14, governors are sent out by him, by the emperor, to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. But what if the evil they're calling is you and you're the evil? What do you do? Well, in verse 15, it's God's will, he's given us clarity here, it's God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. In other words, we're still called to do good even when people question it and call it evil. Ultimately, we know we'll be vindicated. That's the word I was looking for a while ago. Ultimately, we know we'll be vindicated when God comes, when God sends His Son at the return of Jesus Christ because people will see our good works and they'll know that wasn't you, that was God, and they will praise him for what he did in your life and through your life. But until then, we are to submit to authority, and by our good works, we silence all of the foolishness out there that people say. But when we submit, we submit as free people. We willingly lay down our lives, not using our freedom as a cover-up for evil, but we're God's slaves. And we honor everyone. We love the believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. We fear God and we honor the emperor. Now, there are exceptions to this. You see it in history. You see it in the time of Daniel and the lion's den. You see it with Daniel's friends that didn't bow down to the gold statue that Nebuchadnezzar set up. You see it when uh, Peter and John said, we can't stop preaching about Jesus. We're only talking about the things we've seen and heard. And that's where the Bible would teach civil disobedience. When, when man who has power tells you to directly violate the word of God, then you, you basically say, I'm going to obey God rather than men, but you're not rebellious about it. When you look at every case I mentioned in Scripture, none of them were rebellious about it. Even, even um, 
Even the three friends of Daniel says, you know, we're not going to bow down to the statue, king. You can throw us in the fire if you want, but we're not going to bow down to this idol. We serve the living God. You're not rebellious about it. You're not resentful about it. You're respectful authority. You recognize that all authority is ultimately submitted to God who is the ultimate authority. And so then it gets a little bit more sticky in our day and age when we like to talk about rights and shun responsibilities. Then he brings up slaves. Now again, the Bible merely speaks truth to what is going on in the world. In that day and time, slavery was common. It was part of the Roman Empire's economy. And so because of Christianity, and history bears this out, because the gospel changes hearts, that ultimately changed the social structure of history. But here's what God's Word says in verse uh, 18. Household slaves, submit to your masters with all reverence. Now he's talking about not just behavior, but attitude. Submit to your masters. Okay, kind of have to do that. With all reverence. Oh, now you're putting an attitude in there. Submit to your masters with all reverence, not only to the good and gentle ones, but also to the cruel. And I read that and I go, wow, if I'm getting this letter from Peter and I'm reading that and I'm a slave, I'm thinking, what? You've got to be kidding me, Peter. You mean, you mean my friend who, who's a slave as well, his master's cruel to him. He beats him every day. If he looks at him crossways, if he says one word, he gets beat down. You mean, you mean submit to him and do it with reference? Here's what he says. For it brings favor if, because of a consciousness of God, someone endures grief from suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you do wrong and you're beaten, you endure it? But when you do what is good and suffer, if you endure it, this brings favor with God. Now again, realities and imperatives. Remember what I said at the beginning of this message? As you read 1 Peter, Peter will mention realities and then he'll give you imperatives. Here's what you should do. And so... We look at this, and it was a reality that slavery was a reality in that day and time, in Peter's day. And because of that, some of the masters weren't very good or gentle. They mistreated their slaves, and they were rough with them. That was the reality, okay? And we live in a world where things happen that we don't like, and we have to deal with reality. How do we deal with that? And so here... Uh, He's talking about the battle of the soul, about sinful desires, about slander, about submitting to those in authority that are above you. And then he zeroes in on a practical, concrete example, slaves that have masters that are cruel. And he says, listen, if you do this because you're conscious of God and you endure it, even though it's unjust treatment, If you do what's good and you suffer and you endure it, this brings favor with God. In other words, God knows and God remembers. God sees, God hears. And one of these days when God shows up, he's going to settle the account. He's going to take care of it. But if you suffer for doing something wrong and you endure it, so what? You deserve that. But when you suffer for doing good and you don't deserve it, then that's what brings favor with God. And you know, it's a reasonable argument. It's not something we want to think about. It's not something we want to talk about. But Peter is just giving you the reality and he's giving you the imperative. And he says, look, if this is the situation in your, that you're in, here's what God wants you to do. He wants you to conduct yourselves honorably. He wants you to silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. He wants you to do what is good and endure the consequences And if you do it, you're going to get favor with God. And I don't know about you, but in your prayer life, have you ever prayed for God's favor? And then all of a sudden you felt like you weren't getting any favor? Maybe you need to read this passage today in 1 Peter chapter 2. Because maybe if you're 
praying for favor and you find yourself in an unjust situation, you feel like you're being singled out, you feel like you're being discriminated, you feel like you're being taken advantage of, maybe God is saying, I want to teach you how to deal with your sinful desires that are battling inside of you. I want to show you how to conduct yourselves when people are slandering you and misrepresenting you and attacking your motives. I want you to learn how to submit to those in authority knowing that the problem is not your boss but I can take care of that boss. And at that point, I want you to realize that that you can do that. And so right now, I ask you to think about that because that is the key to favor with God. Now here in Matthew 5, uh, I'm reminded of what Jesus taught. He said, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters who are doing, uh, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? And he says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So even Jesus, he tells us, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, and if you just treat people right that treat you right, everybody does that. And so he says, look, I want you to learn to submit to me. I want you to learn how to depend on me. And Peter had to learn this battle of the soul. He he blew it when he did it on his own. But when he learned that the battle had been won by Jesus and he learned to depend on Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, then he won the battle of the soul through Christ. So how how do we follow his steps? Well, let's look in verse 21. Because Peter wants us to get a glimpse of another reality that changes everything about this battle of the soul. In verse 21, he says, For you were called to this, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So how do we follow Jesus' steps? Well, the first thing we do is we look at his example. Before we say, I don't believe in suffering, I don't like it, and I'm not going to take it, we need to realize that, look at, look at Jesus. He died on the cross. He didn't deserve that. He didn't do anything wrong. He was falsely accused. He, he, he did all that for you and I. And so Christ suffered for us, leaving an example that we should follow in his steps. It says he did not commit sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. In other words, he didn't have those sinful desires because... He was born of a virgin and, and from the Father. And so he was completely God. He was completely man. There was no sin in him. And even though he was tempted, just like you and I are, as the Bible says, he never sinned. And so he didn't commit sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. And it says when he was insulted, okay, he did not insult in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. So, you know, no issue with the sinful desires. He didn't slander anyone, and he submitted to the Father. He entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And it says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And again, we started in verse 11 talking about the war against the soul, and now we talk about the shepherd of our souls. And so how do you follow Jesus' steps? You look at his example. Look what he did. He suffered for you and I. And then look at the cross. Now, I love this. If your Bible... um, highlights or puts in bold the Old Testament verses. Uh, Mine does whenever I'm reading the New Testament, and it quotes a verse from the Old Testament. It puts it in bold. And there are three different verses here, starting in verse 22, 24, and 25 of 1 Peter 2, where Peter is quoting the Old Testament. And what's cool is, I didn't realize this until I started studying Peter, but Peter quotes the Old Testament a lot. And in this particular passage today, he's quoting three different verses from the same passage in the Bible. 
and that is Isaiah 53. I want to read uh, five verses from Isaiah 53, because Isaiah 53, you know what it's talking about? Isaiah 53 is talking about a suffering servant that will come. It's known as a messianic passage. It's referring to the Messiah who will come, and he'll be a suffering servant. And Isaiah is saying things here. I want you to picture yourself 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem at the foot of the cross on that Friday when Jesus was crucified and died. Here's what Isaiah saw hundreds of years before that. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shears, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. What a descriptive, powerful commentary of what Jesus went through on the cross. And no wonder Peter is remembering this as he's giving us these imperatives in light of these realities. Our flesh doesn't want to hear it. Nobody wants to hear it. But then he says, look at Jesus. Look at his example. Look at the cross. Look at how he died. Look at why he died. And then he says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness and by his wounds you've been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And Peter can say that from experience. Because after Peter denied Jesus three times, after Jesus was buried in that tomb, and on the third day he rose again, he appeared to many, including Peter. And he was on the shore. And I love this story. I'll make it short. But if you remember Peter on the night that he betrayed Jesus, remember he got access to the courtyard because of John and he was warming himself around a fire. The Bible says it was a charcoal fire. And as he's at that charcoal fire, not once, not twice, but three different times, hey, don't you know him? Hey, weren't you with him? Hey, I know you're one of him. You speak Galilean. No, no, I don't even know the man. I don't even know what you're talking about. The rooster crows. He remembers what Jesus said, but worse than that, he makes eye contact with Jesus, cut to the heart. Now, after the resurrection of Jesus, one of the appearances is described in John, I think, chapter 20. Jesus is on the shore, and he's got a charcoal fire. And he's got some fish. And they're out in the boat because Peter said, forget all this, I'm going back to what I do and what I know. I know how to fish. And here they are out in the boat on the water. John looks up and says, it's the Lord. And Peter, I mean, he just jumps out and he makes a, a beeline to him. And when they get there, they don't say a word. They know who he is, but they ain't saying a word. And Jesus looks at Peter again. Once, twice, three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Oh, how powerful that is. Peter was restored to fellowship and service with Jesus. And now this man who tried to do it on his own strength, his own power, he now knows, I can't, but Jesus can. And then after Jesus ascends to heaven, 40, you know, uh, 40 days he was with them, he ascends to heaven. 10 days after that, the day of Pentecost, 50. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes. And now Peter, this same guy that used to be Simon, who's now called Peter, is filled with the presence of, uh, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And he stands up and boldly declares the gospel. I love that. And I want you to know this. Here is Peter saying, 
I've, I've seen the battle of the soul. And when I tried to do it on my own, I didn't handle it well. But now I have returned to the shepherd and overseer of my soul. And I'm reminded of what Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight: 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up your, uh, my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. If you have been going through the battle of the soul today, I want to ask you one thing. Do you know Jesus? Is he your shepherd? If he is, come to Jesus. If you've never come, come to Jesus. And if you've been saved and and maybe you're not where you need to be, you need to come home. You need to return to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. He's already won the battle and he has won the war and that makes all the difference in the world. And when we depend on him and not ourselves, he gives us the strength to do what He's called us to do. He will give us the victory in this battle of the soul. He he says, greater is He that is in me than He is in the world. And and we know that if we yield to the, the, the Spirit, we won't walk in the flesh. We can win that battle over sinful desires. We can win that battle over slander if we live our life for an audience of one. We can win that, lie, that, that, that battle over submission if we realize that we're submitting to God and we're depending on Him to do what we can't do. My prayer today is whatever God's calling you to do, that you'll take that next step or that first step and trust and follow Him. As we stand, as musicians come, Let's pray. Father, I come before you right now. I pray that you'd speak to each and every heart that is here listening. And Father, I pray that you'd have your will and way in our lives. Father, if there's someone here that's never took that first step to turn from their life of sin and trust and follow you, Lord, I pray today would be that day. And Father, I pray for all believers, Lord, that might be struggling with the battle of the soul. I pray, Lord, we'd stop trying to do it on our own would stop being Simon and we would start being Peter. We would walk in the newness of life that we have in Christ. We would depend on the presence and power of the Holy Spirit and we would return to the shepherd and overseer of our souls and we would take upon ourselves that that yoke that is easy and the burden is light when we depend on His, His strength, your strength, Lord, and not ours. Lord, have your will and way in this time of invitation. Father, I pray that we'll simply trust and obey and follow you in Jesus' name. bless you. I hope you have a a great weekend. For those on fall break, enjoy it, teachers. It doesn't last long.
And uh, don't forget to put on your calendar two weeks from today, our church picture day, one big, large group photo. Go ahead. Amen. Uh, and speaking of fall break, um, we will not have children's event this Wednesday. I think they announced that in Iwana, but in case your little one did not come home and tell you that, we, we, uh, we have a lot of teachers involved in Iwana, and we try to give them a break and the kids a break, so, so uh, enjoy that time with your little one uh, this Wednesday night. The youth will meet, um, and uh, we will be here, so um, go ahead and come for that, and hope to see you then. Um, and next Sunday... I, man, I should, I should carry notes with me. If you don't have a, a youth and a children's calendar, I have several. I didn't read mine this morning before announcements because we have a lot coming up. Uh, so they don't have anything Wednesday night, but that's all right because Sunday we're going to make up for it. Uh, we're going to leave here and go to a restaurant I won't mention has golden arches. And uh, we'll go from there to uh, have Bear Waller. This is a family event. So if you have a little one, not Bailey, but if you have a, a, a little one other than Bailey, and you would like, no, I'm joking, she can come too. She was like, can I not come? Yes, you can. Uh, but this is a family event. You come and bring yours, and if you need a break, you can drop them off. Uh, it's all good, but no, seriously, it's next, uh, next Sunday. We'll go eat uh, kid food and then go to Bear Waller and have some, what? Good, good. There it is. Good, clean, fun. Um, the following week, we are visiting... The, uh, the shut-ins. Uh, so if, if you have someone, I've been, I've been uh, praying this week, uh, if you know someone that is, is off the radar, uh, put them back on. You call me, and we will, we will check on them and, and, and love on them and visit with them. So we want, we want to make sure no excuses. You know, if you've got a grandma that used to go here, and man, I, I want to know about it. We want to love on them uh, and, and take time for that.